Thanks for taking time to listen to this episode of The Real Rescue Podcast. Take a minute to go to therealrescue.com to check out these and other great deals from our sponsors here at The Real Rescue. This episode of The Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. Axness, because when lives are at stake and conditions are challenging, clear communication is of the utmost importance. Life Saving Systems Corporation. We do our work so you can do yours. Tough gear for tough jobs. And SR3 Rescue Concepts, because you don't know what you don't know. Breeze Eastern. They dedicate themselves to our helicopter rescue world. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November of 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and the unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those being rescued has not. Contact them today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. The Axness PNG Wireless ICS System can bring cutting-edge wireless intercommunication system technology to any aircraft. The PNG system can be fully integrated into an existing ICS system or can be carried on and off as a mobile base station. They can go anywhere, at any time, on any aircraft. Plus, with the strongest and most robust waterproof handheld on the market, this system can take a hit and keep working. Their wireless intercom systems are designed to enhance situational awareness through improved communication capability. This system brings superior noise canceling technology to eliminate rotor wash and engine noise from your ICS. The Axness PNG wireless system is currently deployed in more than 1,800 public safety, air ambulance, and search and rescue aircraft worldwide. I have personally used the Axness system in four different countries and on five different airframes. It is awesome. If you want more information, contact them today at axness.com. That's A-X-N-E-S dot com. You just make sure you tell them Quinny sent me. Life Saving Systems Corporation. They manufacture the world's toughest helicopter rescue gear. From my favorite harness as a rescueman, the Triton harness, to the rescue baskets, the litters, and of course, the most popular hook in all helicopters, the D-Lock. The team at LSE will cut bend, sew, weld, and machine these products into existence every day. We do our work so you can do yours. LSC, tough gear for tough jobs. Check them out today at lifesavingsystems.com and follow them on Instagram at Rescue Gear. That's at R-E-S-Q-G-E-A-R. And SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help with your helicopter training, a standardization and safety check, or maybe just an audit or an FAA refresher. They are here to bring your agency up to date with the most current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. The training staff is awesome. With a certified flight instructor pilots, experienced crew members, which I am happy to say that I am one of them, they offer training in rescue, medical, tactical, firefighting, ground operations, and night vision goggle use. SR3 has also partnered with Petzl to assist with personal protective equipment and the highly specific Lazard. SR3 also goes beyond the helicopter world as they provide high angle rescue training and tactical medicine training. Contact them today at sr3rescueconcepts.com or over on Instagram at sr3 underscore rescue. I like taking the opportunity of using the Real Rescue podcast to to really embellish everybody's story and bring them and their stories to light. In addition to that, this next guest, uh, we didn't actually talk about this on the podcast, and I wanted to I wanted to recognize him right here, right now, uh, because he actually earned an award, which doesn't really have to do with rescue as much as it does like his dedication to the job. So I'm going to read this right now and. And then I'll introduce him. So 
the Naval Helicopter Association, NHA. This is dated 3 March 1988. The president of the Gulf Coast chapter of Naval Helicopter Association takes pleasure in presenting a regional award for Air Crewman of the Year, 1987. Again, Air Crewman of the Year. AMS-1, Eric Williamson, United States Navy. For service set forth of the following. Citation. For meritorious service while serving as an Air Crewman for Helicopter Combat Support Squadron 16. AMS-1 Williamson personally established vibration-based line operator instructions for both the H-1 and H-3 aircraft and is the only active duty NAESU qualified vibration analyst instructor Navy-wide. He is an air crewman, functional check flight instructor and evaluator, search and rescue standardization instruction, and the UN-1N aircrew NATOPS instructor. Petty Officer Williamson is a superlative air crewman and the cornerstone of the squadron's air crew program. His ability, concern, and drive makes Petty Officer Williamson the finest air crewman at HC-16 and the Gulf Coast Naval Helicopter Association Air Crewman of the Year. Amazing. And I'm so happy that he was able to send this to me and I'm, I'm stoked that I get to present it to everybody out there because this award right here is, is really, it's, it's distinguished amongst a lot of us that, that work in aviation um, as air crew members and to earn Air Crewman of the Year in 1987, you know what, well done. So please welcome our next guest, United States Navy rescue swimmer, Mr. Eric Williamson. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Real Rescue. I've got another Navy rescue swimmer with us. A uh, little bit of old school coming at us with some great stories that I'm totally pumped about hearing. Please welcome uh, United States Navy rescue swimmer, Mr. Eric Williamson. What's up, sir? How are you? Good morning. Good. I'm doing really good today. Glad to talk to you. Glad to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm totally pumped you're here. Uh, you know, you and I have been playing a little bit of email tag and and boom, making this happen. Yeah. So this is this is good. Um, long distance. Long, yeah. uh, this is definitely a long distance relationship. <laughs> Happy to keep it going. Happy to keep it going. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, man. Uh, again, thank you so much for, for joining me and being willing to tell some stories. I know, uh, you know, I, I just talked to Bill Moss not too long ago, who, again, you know him, and, and you're a little bit of the old school. Red dog. Yeah, Red Dog. Come on, Red Dog. Um, yeah. Yeah, Red Dog. Uh, I I go a long way back with Red Dog. I was a very junior sailor, a rescue swimmer, and Red Dog was one of the only one, two or three master chiefs that were in the Navy that were still rescue swimmers. And Red Dog and Jim Kelly were two of them. And Red Dog is, uh, I want to say famous, but I should say he's infamous. He's, uh, <laughs> he's pretty notorious. <laughs> You know, we we might have had a couple stories offline that I did have a really good laugh at. I promise. I was like, ah, yeah. no, you know. <laughs> so that's Red else, Dog. He's gonna. Yeah. He's gonna. There's one thing about Red Dog is he don't uh, he don't shade the truth at all. He says exactly the way he says that. There's. I've been in a couple of meetings where he was asked to leave, so I I know exactly exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, some people can't handle the truth. I'm just saying. <laughs> right I, about I did just drop that line. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, Mr. Eric, if you don't mind, just a little bit of introduction. Tell us a little bit of background about you, how you got into the Navy, and how you became a rescue swimmer. Okay. Uh, I, was, uh, I was fresh out of high school, uh, kind of. So where I was raised at in uh, around Seattle, Washington, uh, I, it was in the late 70s. Uh, I saw 
I didn't see a whole lot of future. And I, I saw uh, my cousin was a, a uh, in Vietnam and he was a helicopter crewman. And I thought, you know, I should join the Navy. I think that might give me some guidance, give me some structure, kind of get me out of where I was at. And, you know, a lot of, it's the same story with a lot of people who join the military, you know, they're doing it for different reasons. And, and that was my real reason was just to kind of get going in a clear path and clear direction. And uh, so I joined the Navy and uh, went to uh, San Diego for boot camp. Uh, after boot camp, I went to Millington, Tennessee for uh, my A school. And I was what's called a, uh, I was an aircraft metalsmith, which is AMS. So once I was going to uh, A school, as you're going through the course, you get with the first week you sit down and they actually have you fill out a bunch of paperwork. And one of the things they bring in there to you is called a dream sheet. Now, some of the old school guys will remember that. Yeah, it's actually I had a dream sheet. A little Come on. Hard. Yeah. Yeah, actually write on it and tell them what you want to do and where you want to go and what place you'd like to be stationed and things like that. And uh, the guy sitting right next to me, he was filling his out. And I kind of glanced over at it and he put uh, air crew on there. And I said, what's that? And he said, air crew, you get to, if, if you select for air crew, you get to fly an aircraft and things like that. And I said, oh man, that sounds cool. I said, absolutely. So I wrote air crew on mine. And uh, then he said, uh, he goes, if you want to fly in helicopters, you write uh, rescue rescue on there, rescue crewman. And I went, oh, man, that would be awesome. I said, hell, yeah, that sounds great. So I wrote that down. I had no idea what I was getting into, <laughs> none, zero. So oh, when uh, I got orders, it said report to uh, HS1 Jacksonville, Florida for rescue swimmer school. And uh, – then for orders from there to NAS Meridian, Mississippi. And I was thinking, what is rescue swimmer school? And I was a pretty good swimmer. I mean, I was raised in, in Washington state, with a lot of lakes, a lot of rivers. I mean, I spent more time in the lake swimming in the rivers swimming than anything. That was what we did during the summertime for fun. Yeah. Uh, so I reported into, I left Meridian, Mississippi. I bought a 1971 Torino super sport. Drove to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, got there and reported for school. But once I got there, they uh, they hadn't started the class up yet. So they just told me, now this difference between back then and back now, you know, or now is, is completely different. Uh, I mean, when I reported to school and rescue swimmer school at that time, HS1 Jacks was run and mostly by instructors that had come out of Vietnam. So they oh. were all Vietnam era I mean, this is 77, 1977, yeah. in the summer of 77, when I reported to school. So I saw these guys, these rescue swimmer instructors uh, that were all Vietnam vets, but I'm not talking about Vietnam vets. I'm talking about guys that were really grizzled, ordinary men back then, yeah. you know. And uh, so I said, well, I'm here for class. And they said, class doesn't start for 10 days. Come back in 10 days. And I said, what am I supposed to do? And they said, oh, I. The guy just looked at me. He said, I said, get out of here. Don't come back for 10 days. I don't care where you go or what you do. Oh, okay. okay. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I ended up driving to, my, driving to my cousin's house and spending 10 days. And then I reported back in. Now, in those 10 days, I did absolutely nothing. But you can imagine during, <laughs> during that time, frame, I, was, I was definitely not doing any PT or anything like that. And everything so, you every, should have been doing, yeah, you weren't. Yeah, I was not doing <laughs> not at all, not in any way, shape, or form. So oh. I reported in for school, and uh, I got to the barracks. I got my stuff. They said, uh, "Grab your paperwork, you know your inspection dungarees." Report in front of the school. So we got to the school. We're standing around milling about. And they put us in formation. They said, "All right, drop your bags, drop your paperwork on the ground in front of you." And they say, let's go. We're going to run. Now, I'm in, we're in our dungarees and everything, boondockers, the whole nine yards. They said, we're going to run. Anybody stops, anybody quits, you're out of the school. Oh, Day my. One. So, <laughs> yeah, so it was all right face, forward march, double time, and we started running. And behind us, they followed us with a pickup truck. And anybody that dropped out, Got in the pickup truck, and uh, when we got back to the class, never saw them again. They dropped them out that day one. So 
uh, we ran from the HS1 hangar towards the hospital. I learned later on it was a six mile run, three miles out, three miles back. What? And I would say we lost half the class day one, first hour. Now, I have no idea if they put them in some kind of remedial course or whatever. Uh, you know, later on in my career, I learned a lot more about Rescue Swimmer and how it runs and everything. And we'll go into that later. But okay. So we started started class and, and that's how I ended up going to getting into Rescue Swimmer School. And yeah, it was a it was a harrowing experience, to say the least. I had no idea what I was getting into, but I halfway through school, I made my mind up that I was going to, I was going to get out. I was going to drop this. I said, this is crazy. I mean, these guys are just beating the devil out of us. I just couldn't believe how, what we were going through. And anybody hey, that's been to you know swimmer school really hey, understands what I'm talking about. Totally. And as a matter of fact, one of my buddies, it's uh, out, in, out in Australia, um, Sam, he was like, I got flogged in the pool. I'm like, yes, yes. That's exactly what happens. <laughs> I was, uh, oh my gosh. we were doing a, a term back then. There was a, there was something called sharks and daisies, yeah. which is, uh, that back then it was, you know, a standard operating procedure. I mean, it was, it was something that they did all the time. And during one of them training exercises, when we were swimming, an instructor come up, you know, you, you could swim and you didn't have goggles back then. And we didn't have a mask at that point in the training. And you could swim along and I could look and at the bottom of the pool was two lawn chairs that were weighted with uh, sandbags and there was a oxygen tank down there. Well, as you were swimming, you look down and all of a sudden there'd be two instructors sitting down there in these chairs with this oxygen, breathing it, watching you swim. And uh, when they decided to, they just come up from the bottom and grab a hold of you and you better be ready to react. Well, when they did that, uh, one of them grabbed me and, I did the maneuver and got him in, into a, a cross his carry. And when I did, one of the other instructors came up from the bottom and grabbed me again. And so I kind of took a, a knee to the area that nobody wants to take a knee to. So they ended up uh, dragging me out of the pool. And uh, I ended up going to the hospital that day. When I came back uh, a day later, I had to get extra training because they said I had, I had missed you know, a whole day of training. So I got the extra training, but, uh, it's a, it's a whole different environment back then. But I, I, at that point I said, I was going to quit, but I, uh, uh, we had to stand watches back then. So they sent me down to HS1 Jacksonville to stand a watch. And I was a fire watch for the hangar. I has to walk around the hangar with a flashlight and look for fires. It was yep. crazy, but it's one of those military duties that somebody's got to do. Well, yeah. they had a SAR mission. SAR crew, they, they pulled the H3 out, started it up. The pilots went out there. And then here, out comes walking this guy in his wetsuit with his gear and the crewman. And I'm standing there in awe, you know, just can't believe what I'm watching. They launched and came back about an hour later. And they had uh, this guy and this lady that were soaking wet. And they had a kid in the Stokes litter and the kid was maybe 10, 11 years old and they had rescued him off a sailboat. And when they, they brought that kid out and this rescue swimmer jumps out of the helicopter, you know, he's still wet. And this mother is, is crying. The dad's shaking his hand and the mother's hugging his neck and kissing on him. And, uh, I said, that's it. I'm not quitting. There ain't no way I'm quitting this school. They can do whatever they want to. I am not quitting this school. This oh. is, I'm going to do this. So we you know, I just got chills right now. This is awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, we, uh, we, we started with 40, a little over 40, and we only finished with, uh, I think, 10 or 11 students at the end of the class. And uh, so from there, after that, on to Meridian, Mississippi. And that's why how I uh, uh, got into Rescue Swimmer School. Oh my good lord, that is awesome! <laughs> yeah. The drive, like that mental flip in the switch, just it's go time. I am not quitting. Yeah, that I is said, what I want. Yeah, I said there's there's nothing they can do to make me quit this one. This yeah, um, it, was, it was a life changing event, is what really what it was. That is awesome. Oh, I'm so pumped right now. I'm like I'm ready to go like PT right now. Let's let's go. Come on, Eric. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's incredible. 
All right, so now you you busted your ass, like mindset changed. You get through school, qualified. Do you remember your very first case? Yeah, I do. I I remember it vividly. Uh, and not all not all cases are glory and and everything that's there's a lot of in rescue swimmer as with any uh first line police law enforcement officer medical it doesn't matter 10 percent is glory 10 percent of it is great it actually worked out everything you want 90 percent of it is recovering a body a medevac something of that nature and those are the ones that really you know i i think back on it and i can remember the good times but i can remember the bad times as well and the things that you go through and the things you see and uh it's a lot of people can only do four years of this and that's it and and they just have had enough of it you know they can't they can't deal with it anymore. They have a, uh, they don't know how to internalize it or compartmentalize it. And it really affects them in a bad way. And they end up having to go do something else or get out of rescue swimmer community or do something. And a lot of it, even your job in the rescue swimmer community for us, we recall was back then we were non-tax. It was AWs and everybody else. Everybody else was a ADs, AMs, AMHs, you know, uh, ATs, AEs, all, all that rate. And we were what was called non-tac, and the AWs were what they called tactical. Or they were uh, because they actually got in the helicopters and they did more sonar. And 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 AWs didn't do a lot of SAR back then. The only SAR that they did was uh, flying Star Delta on a carrier. And uh, if a plane went in the water, they of course were there to rescue the uh, pilots or people that fell overboard. But they weren't really nine to five day job of being a rescue swimmer. So uh, being a non-tac, uh, a lot of those guys would only do a certain number of years and then just say, hey, I can't, I can't deal with this anymore and they got to do something else. But, but you know, uh, in that regard, I, I, I still remember back the bad ones. I and mean, my first one was not a great, not a great thing. There was a, uh, and when I got to Meridian, Mississippi, uh, I had just reported in. I wasn't really, I'd done my initial calls and everything. And uh, there was a, a guy I was stationed with there. It was uh, uh, Jack Stiatley. Jack Stiatley is a man among men. He is, uh, he's well known. I still talk to him today. He's, anybody that's been in the rescue swimmer community for that, that period of time knows that this man. He's, he's a great guy. He really is. But he's a mountain of a man. All right. And I was scared. To, I was scared to death of him because <laughs> when I went to rescue swimmer school, you know, when you first got there, you had to write your name on your shirt. Well, my name, Williamson, is a long name. So and they they tell you, we need your name on your shirt. So when we pull your body out of the pool. We know who we're pulling out. This sounds wonderful. But, you know, when I started writing the name, you had to freehand your name. And I got W.I.L.L.I. Oh, oh, no, I got too big and I had to write. A-M-S-O-N underneath my arm. I said, well, I ain't going to do that again. I flipped the shirt over, did it again, did the exact same thing. So it looked like my name was Willie. <laughs> and uh, uh, so when I was going through school, Jack Stiley called down there and asked how I was doing. They said, he's doing good. He's going to graduate. And uh, he said, Airman Williamson. And he go, they go, Willie? Yeah, he's going to graduate. So Jack Stiley started calling me Willie. There was about I'd say four or five people still alive today that actually call me Willie. And that's because they knew me back when I was an airman a long, <laughs> long time ago. And, uh, so uh, it's, a, it's wonderful I, I get the, how the, uh, the military goes with their, their nicknames and how all of a sudden you get a nickname. It just, you do something yeah, stupid I, or you, you, yeah, you tweak something and all of a sudden there is your nickname for the rest of your career. Yeah. <laughs> And don't and don't ever let anybody know you don't like it because then that's right. everybody's oh, going to call you that. It makes it even right. worse. Yep. <laughs> so you got name I tags. Was, uh, you got. I was, yeah, oh. I was sitting in the in the SAR shack, and uh, there was a uh, Lake Okatibi, a very large lake out in, uh, in right outside of Meridian, big recreational area, and uh, they had launched a couple. I, I think we had we had four h46s at the time and uh they launched two of them 
to go out and search for this boy that was lost, six-year-old boy. And uh, so Jack slightly walked into what we call the SAR shack. It was just a place we all kind of hung out waiting for, you know, to do daily and turnarounds, things on the aircraft, stuff like that. And Jack slightly walked in and said, uh, he said, Willie, you got all your gear? I said, yeah. He goes, get it. We're going. I said, where are we going? He goes, you know, pretty much just shut up and do what you're told. Yeah. Roger that. Roger cool. that. <laughs> grab my gear, grab my gear, run out to the helicopter. I'm putting all my gear on. And so we fly out to Lake Okatibia. Now we're searching everywhere for this boy. And uh, as we're flying along, unfortunately, Jack uh, found him. And uh, he was he was floating in the in the kind of the shallow area with a lot of reeds and a lot of uh, brush and everything. And uh, so I put my wetsuit on and got ready. And Jack hoisted me down and I was able to get a hold of him and, and then bring him, put the horse collar on and bring him up in the helicopter. But at that point, you know, yeah. it was obvious that he was, he had, he had passed. But w- what we were taught back then is we can't make a call of whether he's alive or dead. That okay. was only for a medical professional. So we, part of our requirements were to start CPR. So we started CPR on him, myself and Jack, and we did CPR on him from there all the way to the hospital and uh, then turned him over to the hospital staff. But yeah, so my first real hands-on, my responsibility didn't turn out as good as, as I would have hoped, but you know, it, it's all part of the job. I mean, you can't, right. you try to save everybody. You try to do your damnedest and you know, our motto so others may live, put our life on the line to save other people and do everything we possibly can. But you know, it's just one time it, it, it didn't work out that way, but what it didn't tough, deter tough. me from the fact of knowing that there is a potential that I'm going to have to save somebody's life. And I'm ready to do that if I have to. Yeah. And wow. no matter what, what the conditions are or whatever, do what I can. Tough, man. That is a tough first case to come out of. Wow. Solid. Yeah. Solid. But I, I had some really good ones while I was in Meridian too. That was, that was, you know, um, uh, Meridian at that time was the biggest training center for jets in uh, that. And there was no life flight helicopters back then. There was nothing, none of that. Uh, It was all uh, us. We got called for everything, civilian, military. It didn't matter. I mean, we were going on every call. And back then we didn't have cell phones, of course. We just had beepers. If you had you had the duty, you carried a beeper with you everywhere. (laughs) uh, Old school. uh, Come on. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, you know what? I, ca- it gets, I carried a beeper for a little while too. Just, you're like, oh, what's this? Yeah. Say that? I, I can't quite read it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we were we were original when they first came out with beepers too. They just beeped and you had to call, figure out what's going on. Oh, but, that's uh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, went on went on a few rescues. Uh, that big one that you I sent you that information on too that you asked about. That was uh, that was pretty harrowing there. So the big case, uh, the big case you're talking about is while you're in Mississippi, right? Yes. Yeah. It was. So, so this story you have here is pretty cool. You actually have a couple good write ups with it, and I, I'm psyched to actually read a little bit of this because you got um, a a write up not only from the Boeing company but also the state of Mississippi in the uh the house of representatives so i'm actually going to start with reading the state of mississippi in there the a brief of the um the house of representatives write up which is again super cool and then i'll i'll go right into you know the the next one which is super cool the you know that from the boeing company so this is what this one says right here and it is State of Mississippi, Joint Resolution Number 24, a joint resolution commending members of the U.S. Navy Search and Rescue Team based at Naval Air Station Meridian and certain Lauderdale County officials for their courageous life-saving efforts. Whereas, in the dark, dreary, rainy evening of March 4, 1979, an automobile containing four passengers was swept from the spillway at the Dale Shore Lake into the main channel of the Reed Creek in Lauderdale County. And whereas, although the automobile was completely inundated with water, the four passengers managed to scramble to the top of the vehicle before it was completely engulfed. And 
whereas member of the Lauderdale County Sheriff's Department, Lauderdale Fire Department, and the Sea Tramps section of the Rescue Squad, Dalewood Security Force, and other local officials were summoned to the scene of the accident to rescue the stranded passengers. Whereas several valiant attempts were made by the local officials to rescue the passengers, but none were successful. And whereas the U.S. Navy search and rescue helicopter team of Naval Air Station Meridian, Mississippi, was alerted and activated to free the strained passengers. And whereas with courageous effort from the U.S. Navy search and rescue team successfully rescued the stranded passengers from the raging torrent in the very heroic professional manner and required the daring skill for above and beyond the call of duty. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the legislate of the, U- of the state of Mississippi that the U.S. Navy search and rescue team based at Naval Air Station Meridian, Mississippi are to be commended for their brave, courageous, and selfless efforts which were above and beyond the call of duty in saving four lives on the evening of March 4, 1979 in Lauderdale County, Mississippi. Freaking amazing. And then the next one right here goes into rescue citation. This is from the Boeing, uh, directly from the Boeing company. A-M-S-A-N Eric Williamson, a member of SAR division who demonstrated outstanding professionalism in a heroic rescue of four personnel and a dog who were trapped on the roof of an automobile. Their car drove off the causeway and rolled into the spillway where fire officials were unable to rescue due to the severe rapids. SAR was dispatched, hoisted the victims and the dog into the HH-46 aircraft, and later released them to the local authorities at the scene. Oh my gosh, Eric, you, you got to give us a rundown of this, because this is freaking awesome. Yeah, that's no problem. Uh, I was at home. Uh, I just married i just came back off of leave uh went to boston got married came back off of leave uh and it was my first duty day nice back, hey, wait, after, wait hold on after you, got, leave. you got married in boston i got married in massachusetts in uh, a place called southampton massachusetts which that's, is not very far from where you were raised that's right that's what i'm talking about see no wonder you and i get along <laughs> so well come on <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Nice. I'm about a, people, people kind of, people kind of kid me because I live down here in Mississippi now, and people kind of kid me of that I still got a little Yankee twang in my voice, and uh, <laughs> I say, yeah, my wife is from Southampton or Holyoke, Massachusetts, and nice. uh, so that's where I met her in Meridian, which is kind of funny through another rescue swimmer. He Excellent. was he he's from Massachusetts, and he still lives up there, but she came down to visit his wife, and I met her and. We hit it off and ended up getting married in in uh, seventy nine in February seventy nine. Beautiful. So I had just came, yeah, I had just come back from uh, leave, getting married, and we got to. Uh, I went in, checked back in, got my beeper. They said I had the duty. I said, "Roger that." Went home. About uh, we had a hurricane that came through there, Hurricane Frederick, I want to say what it was back in 79, and uh, torrential rainstorms, just unbelievable amount of rain. So uh, my, the beeper went off, and I, I rolled over. I picked up the beaker. I, I called, and they said, yeah, come on in. We got a mission. I said, okay. So I jumped in my car, and I drove to, to the base, which was about uh, 15, 20 minutes away. I got to the base. Drove in the front gate, and uh, as I was driving in the front gate, another rescue swimmer, he said he'd heard all the sirens and everything. He came out the barracks as I was driving by, and I saw him. I slowed down, and he said, what's going on? I said, I got, we got a call. So he jumped in my car, and uh, that was Rick Blevins. Okay. And uh, so we drove to the base and got down there, and they said, get your wet gear on. Uh, so we got, uh, we got a mission. It's out at Dalewood Lake. And now Dalewood Lake is a lake that's not very far from Meridian, kind of a residential, rural residential area. They had really, really nice houses all the way around the lake, but they had, uh, it was kind of, uh, the way it 
was built, it had a, a spillway that was a one lane over the top of the spillway. Now you're driving along the dam and as you draw, drive over where the water comes down over the emergency spillway it was one lane. So you had to kind of wait. Now, when there's no water, you could actually drive down onto the spillway and back up the other side if you were coming one way and then somebody would drive on the bridge, if, if, you know, when you're meeting traffic. Yeah. Well, this what had happened was there was about a, a eight foot wall of water coming over that spillway. And these four young, uh, young kids, I want to say 18, 17, 18 years old, not much older than I was at that time. Yeah. Uh, so they had come and drove across a, a spillway. When they went down, they hit that giant wall of water in that car and, and it just swept them right down the spillway and down into the, the raging river. Holy now smoke. at this point in time, yeah, this was, there was, it was like, Every vision you've seen of the Colorado River in its most angriest form in the Grand Canyon, that's yeah. what it looked like. It was some of the roughest water I've ever seen. It was really intense. Well, they had uh, the Dalewood Fire Department, the Sheriff's Department, the rescue teams the, uh, were all out there. And what had happened is they, they flipped the boat over already trying to get to them. Had to pull all the people out of the water. They tried to. They had to try to get a guy tied onto a rope and swim out there. He almost drowned. They pulled him out. Had to take him in an ambulance to the hospital. That's when they called us. So uh, we we launched the helicopter. Now we're flying around, and as you can imagine, you know, looking out the door of the helicopter uh, of H forty six at the time. Now this is a. There's a lot of configurations to the H-46 on how to rescue. You can you have an external boom hoist <clears throat> on outside the cabin door, okay. or you can hoist out over the rear of the helicopter, or you can hoist right through the middle of the helicopter through the hell hole is what they called it. So you and, had uh, three hoists on the inside of this aircraft? No, no, it was one hoist. You could just configure it three different ways. Oh, that's awesome! You could go out the out. Well, it, it was it was. Yeah, it sounds awesome, but it was really manually intensive to get this all rigged up. And usually, oh, whichever okay. way it was rigged up was the way you did it. Um, and we yeah. like going through the hellhole because the hellhole, uh, there's less downforce from the rotor wash. Going right, because you're already in the middle of the sweet spot. Totally. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we did a we did a once or once or twice around. You know, we're talking them on on the radio. Uh, and, uh, you know, telling them what we're going to plan and everything. And, and there's probably, you know, everybody that lived around the lake was out there. There was the, the levee was packed with cars and ambulances and fire engines and everything and all the red lights flashing and everything. And so we turned around and we started to do our approach. And the idea was that they were going to hoist me down through the hell hole and we could see the car, the car was actually in the raging torrent and was stuck on top of a stump. So it was like teetering on top of this stump. And all four of these people were on top of the car. But Jeez, oh man. It's kind of it's kind of precarious because if any one person moved, it was going to be too much weight on one side. The car was going to go in the water and and the way this water was going, there was they were not going to survive. It was just not going to happen. It was that bad. So we started doing our approach and when we did our approach, we got to about a hundred feet and we're lined up coming into the wind on this. It just so happens we're facing towards the dam where all the people are. And uh, they started taking pictures and <laughs> it was like, it was like a million flash bulbs going off and the pilot, he's like, Whoa, whoa. And you, you can feel a helicopter rocking back and forth. And I was sitting in the hellhole just ready to go down and he had to divert and wave off. And he came back around and around that time is when we just got what's called the loud hailer. It was a giant uh, speaker system on the side of the helicopter yeah. that you could actually talk through. And uh, um, so he got on that and he told everybody, no flash photography, no flash photography. I mean, the newspaper crew were out there. The television crews were out there. They've been trying to get these people for a couple hours. So, um, we came back around and, uh, uh, they lowered me down on the hoist and, uh, the crew chief, uh, and 
Rick Blevins were both sitting there. And Rick Blevins, he looked me right square in the face and he said, whatever you do, do not get off that hoist. Don't get off that hoist. Absolutely. Now, Rick was senior to me and he, he'd had a little more experience than me. And uh, uh, I kind of looked up to him and I, oh, I did look up to him and he told me, don't get off that hoist. Whatever you do, do not get off that hoist. So we lowered us down. And uh, lowered me down. And I got down to the to the car. And now there's three guys and a girl, all about 18, 17, 18 years old, standing on top of this car. And the girl had a dog under her arm. Of and course I she did. Over her and I said, <laughs> and I said I, it's always got to have a dog involved. It's always got to have a dog. Involved. Come on. <laughs> so uh, she said, uh, I, I looked at her and I, I taught my lungs. I'm screaming at her because, you know, the water is raging in the helicopter and, uh, I'm screaming at her and I told her, I said, uh, you first. And I screamed at the guys. I said, get towards the middle. So we all kind of crowded towards the middle and I got, uh, her put the horse collar on her and uh, gave the signal and up we went with the dog and all got her up there, went through the hell hole, got her in. They lowered me back down. Second guy did the same thing for him. Got him on the horse collar, ho hollered him up. Third guy went down and got him and, uh, lowered him up. Now I go back down for the last guy and uh, get on top of the uh, car. And this guy is, I'm not going to say he was fat, but he was a little overweight. And okay. uh, just as I'm getting ready to, I'm almost feet on the ground, almost feet on top of the car. And he slips and falls off into the water <gasps> and he goes down. Oh, maybe no about, way. Yeah. He goes, he, he goes down maybe, maybe about, 20 feet down from the car and he gets hung up in the branches and I can see his head coming up, up out of the water and then going back under coming up, going back under. And I'm, I look up at the helicopter and, and Rick and uh, uh, I know his first name was Bill. I can't remember his last name, but they're both looking They're giving me the cut sign, you know, across their neck. Don't do it. Don't do it. And I reach down and I start to unhook myself and I look back up at Rick and uh Rick's like, get, keeps giving me, don't do it. Don't do it. So I unhook and he just gives me the thumbs up and he says, you know, pretty much do what you got to do. Oh, and the whole my, time I'm thinking, I'm looking at, I'm looking at this guy in the water. I'm saying that guy is going to die. I'm looking at this guy dying. Yeah. I know for a fact he's going to drown. Now my self-confidence at that time is like, there's no way I'm going to drown. You know, they train you and you're so in, I've been through so much through swimmer school and everything. I know I'm not going to drown. It's impossible to make me drown. I know that I can, I can do it. And then I, I think it's, you know, that, that Teflon effect, the instructors in SAR school always told you, look, you're graduating this school. You think you're big and bad, but until you meet somebody that's bigger and badder than you, and they're going to put you on your butt. <laughs> but I know for a fact at that point, I said, I'm looking at this guy and I keep thinking to myself and then you're, you're doing this, you know, at the speed of light, you're right. trying to understand everything. And I said, that guy's going to die if I don't do something. So I unhooked, I slid off the car, and it immediately sucked me right down into that water. And I got to where he was, and I got a hold of him, and I, I was able to get my arm about three-quarters of the way around him, but he was so big I couldn't get all the way around him. So I was able to get his head up out of the water, but by getting his head up out of the water, I was putting my head underwater. So I would hold my breath as long as I could, which was 10 times longer than he could. Yeah. And then I'd have to dunk him a little bit so I could get my head above water and then go back under. So I'm thinking there's too much brush. There's no way that they're going to get that hoist to me. There's no way that cable is going to get to me. So I've got him under one arm and I'm grabbing one limb and pulling myself towards that car and then reaching out and grabbing another limb, pulling myself to the car. And I was able to pull myself all the way to the back of that car pulling this guy because it was kind of like an ebb in the flow behind the car where yeah. it was teetering. Yeah. And I got to the, I got to the uh, trunk of the car and uh, uh, with Rick and, and the other crewmen, the pilots, and they were uh, Lieutenant Blackwood was one of the pilots, just an outstanding pilot, just one of the best pilots I've ever flown with. He could, he could drop that hoist into a five gallon bucket if he had to. So he, uh, he was able to maneuver and get me that hoist and get it in my hand. And I was just able enough to get the horse collar around him. Now, if you've ever worked with a horse collar, you know how big it is. Oh yeah. I could barely 
I had to squeeze that guy's chest as hard as I could to get that that rescue strop around him. Wow. And I hooked him and then and then up we went. Now with our harnesses back then, and I know they've made a lot of changes, and I haven't been in the in the flow for the past what 15 years or so, but uh back then the rescue swimmer, you always hung just a little bit higher than the than the survivor. Right. So up we went. Now up we went. I looked down, and just as we got off that car, that car flipped over and went in the water and no. disappeared. Oh so they my god. Hoisted us, they hoisted us up to the hellhole, and I got to the hellhole, but both of us couldn't fit through the hole together. He was that big, and I was I was I'm six five and and two hundred and 60 pounds right now. And it, back then I was six, five and about a hundred and 180, 190 pounds, maybe 200 pounds tops. There's yeah. no way we could fit through the hole together. So that's where they say you have to, you have to be able to think on your feet. You have to think quick. Yeah. Once again, being in a rescue swimmer and being in a, a helicopter crew is not about one person. It's about everybody together. And at that point, there were five of us. And really, we had a corpsman with us, too. Well, Rick took a gunner's belt and hooked it to a pad eye and then lowered the gunner's belt down to me. I put it around my chest and secured it. And Rick pulled the tension off of the hoist. And I was able to unhook myself. And then he lowered me down and just kind of dropped me. So I was hanging below the helicopter on my gunner's belt. Oh, he was my able, God. They were, able, they were then able to hoist the big, large gentleman up through the the hell hole and get him into the helicopter yeah. and then rick and the other crewman in the quorum and actually pulled me up into the helicopter using the gunner's belt <laughs> and uh at that point then once we got out that we secured we went and landed by the side of the dam and uh transferred all the people to the waiting firemen and ambulance crew and everything and they took them all to the hospital for hypothermia and things like that and then we we took off and uh went back to meridian and landed and then spent the next couple hours cleaning up and getting everything done and talking about it and kind of doing a little debrief and everything and it but it wasn't until later that they uh they did all the recognition and everything and uh gave us all those awards and stuff eric this is crazy like this is exactly you talk about river rescue and stuff and that that's like the first thing you worry about is is people falling in the water and it and then the, the car disappears right after you get the guy, the last guy out of the water. Like, that's like, you can't make it's this like stuff up. It, it, it really is. You it's know, crazy. Yeah, you think about it, and, uh, um, you know, if you told somebody that, they'd go, you know, they'd nod and go, okay, that, wow, that's that's pretty well. But they they kind of like, okay, do I believe this story or not? Sounds like it come out of a movie. But, uh, you know, all those uh, – the Mississippi state legislator did a joint resolution commending the entire crew for the rescue. And then of course we all got rescue pins and rescue awards and things like that. But um, yeah, it's, it's not about the recognition. It's about the, uh, it's about saving somebody's life. I know for a fact, all that training and everything I went through in rescue swimmer school paid off in that one, that one, moment because that person right there if he if we had done what we did at that point he would not be here there's no doubt in my mind that he would have died wow wow that's crazy um oh my gosh yeah. <laughs> well no, bravo to you and your crew for that that entire case wow so I, yeah, pretty, I have never actually been crazy. hoisted out of the hellhole. Like I, I, that's not something that I, I've done. Uh, I'm typically out of the, the side door. Um, 90% of the time, right. even 95% of the time it's on the right side of the aircraft. There's occasional aircrafts that are on the left side that I've been in and out of, but for the most part, it's on the right side but to go in and out of the hellhole like that. The fact yeah. they're lowering down a gunner's belt to then take pressure off the hoist hook so you can disconnect and just like literally hang there so you can get the victim up. That yeah. is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty wild. That's pretty Ugh. wild. Wait, but you know, my first four years in Meridian taught me more about search and rescue and 
than any place I'd ever been. It was, uh, you know, we were, we were on an Island there. We're way out in the middle of nowhere. And, and the things that we did and things that we saw, I was just intense. Uh, it, it really was, uh, we, uh, you know, there's a lot of student pilots there and they, they have a tendency to make a lot of mistakes yeah. and, uh, eventually end up punching out and, uh, 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 rescued a couple of pilots that had punched out and, uh, you know, hung up in trees and different things. But, you know, that's where, uh, the tree extraction that was, that was developed in, uh, at HC 16 in Pensacola, which was then taught to everybody in the Navy and everybody. And matter of fact, the Coast Guard actually came down and was involved in establishing the tree extraction uh, uh, idea and concept and how, how to do it, you know, where right. you actually have a pilot that's hanging from a tree in a parachute and you get up in the tree and you run the lines and you take the stokes litter and you hang the stokes litter down beside him and you strap him into the stokes litter and then lower the stokes litter. All that was developed and initiated starting in Meridian and then transitioned to HC-16 in Pensacola and the people that are a whole lot smarter than me got together and actually, they actually came up and talked to us and a couple of us went down there and helped them. And then they actually started the, through the SAR model manager's office, uh, actually developing the tree extraction idea and concept <laughs> and how to do it. And, and that all derived really from, uh, Andy Knott was, uh, he passed, he's, he's gone now. He's a great, great rescue swimmer, a good friend. Uh, we went to, we were called out on a mission and it was me and uh, Andy Knott, Mac McHugh, a couple pilots, Corman. We were all out looking for this Marine pilot who ejected out of a jet Yeah, and couldn't find him. Now there's portions of Mississippi and Meridian that are very large swamp areas. They're not really deep, but they're very massive, you know, two or three square miles of a swamp. Now a swamp in Mississippi is not like a swamp you think of in Florida, full of alligators and things like this. This is really a lot of trees and just a lot of water. Uh, well, we searched and searched and searched and we're just fixing to leave and head back because we were running low on gas. And just as we were fixing to close the hell hole, we flew right over and Andy Knott says, there it is. And we saw the parachute. Now the parachutes may be a quarter mile out into this water. So the pilot made the decision he was going to land the helicopter, find a place to land as close as we could to that point, shut the helicopter down. And then we were going to walk through the area to get to him. Well, we landed and we started walking and within about 50 yards, we ran into water. So by the time myself and Mac McHugh and Annie not got to the pilot or there was hanging in a tree. He, uh, we were about chest deep in water and sometimes <laughs> a little bit over our head. Oh my and, gosh. Uh, so we ended up getting to him and he, uh, he was in a bad way hanging in that tree, but he was hanging over water that was so deep. We couldn't stand up in it. So we had to kind of, now this is before we had tree climbing gear before we had anything. We just had, what you call tending lines in the helicopter, which were just these nylon ropes. They weren't really designed for what we were using them for. We had a Stokes litter with us. It had some flotation on it, but not like the flotation they have on them today. I mean, it had something around the top of it would just keep the head afloat. It wouldn't really keep the whole thing afloat. So we climbed up in the trees, strapped him in that Stokes litter using this nylon you know, maybe half inch, about a big around your finger line. Yeah. And actually lowered him down in that into that Stokes litter, so strapped him in the Stokes litter, lowered him down, cut all the lines, lowered him down, got him to the helicopter, uh, swimming through this swamp, and actually got him in the helicopter, flew him back and and got him to the helicopter. Well, we uh, found out a couple days later that uh, his mom and dad, the pilot's mom and dad, he was from, uh, I want to say Indiana. They had flown down to be with him and they came to see us and uh, told us that the doctor told them that he had, he had broke his back, both shoulders, both hips, uh, pretty much 
uh, broke almost all of the bones in his back. And if we hadn't done everything exactly the way we did, that he would end up being a quadriplegic. As it was, he was paralyzed from the waist down. But if we hadn't done anything like we did it, he, he'd have been a complete quadriplegic. So, I mean, they thanked us immensely for, for what we did. And uh, um, after that, was, I want to say it was about uh, maybe six months later, we got a, I got a phone call. They wanted us to come down to base ops. And we went down there. And as we walked in, there was this Marine in a wheelchair with his mom and dad and the base CO and Admiral Barth and Captain Morton, who was the base CO at the time. Yeah. And Admiral was a Sinatra uh, Admiral. He was there and uh, they had a, they had a case of Jack Daniels for each one of us. Oh and, uh, yeah. As a, present, as, a, as a token <laughs> of their appreciation for what we had done. And you want to talk there was not a dry eye in the house from the yeah. people that were just standing around watching to all the crew and the family him just an emotional time about that if we hadn't have done the things we did him that he wouldn't have probably may not have survived or may not have been able to even move his arms but it was all by you know sometimes you do things and you look back at it and you go how the hell did i do that i had no yeah. idea what i was doing i'm surprised i actually did it the right way <laughs> and uh I think of that a lot, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you actually, uh, I'm surprised I didn't cut my hand off on that one, you know, but <laughs> in the end, in the end, and I, I guess, you know, they say uh, uh, God loves fools for they make the biggest mistakes. We, <laughs> we probably did the things we did them just because we thought that that was the best way to do it, and it ended up being the best way to do it, Yeah, and that no, I, I, that was a long, long time ago. And, uh, you know, I'd like to meet up with that guy someday, but, uh, we're both getting pretty long in the tooth, so I don't think that's going to happen. But you know, that, that pilot right there, that Marine pilot, yeah, we just did what we thought was right. And it ended up being the right thing to do. And it, and it ended up saving his life. That is incredible. Oh my gosh, Eric, this is crazy. That's awesome. Again, you and your whole crew, like bomb, good job. Yeah, it was it was pretty exceptional. It was that's one of the you see. So the first one was not good, and there was a, quite a few that weren't good. Yeah, you know, uh, but there's a lot of them that were really really good, and you know that's it. It, it comes with the territory. But if you fly, I mean, I've I've got over five thousand hours in H forty sixes, and I've got over a thousand hours in the H1 and uh, all of that, 99% of that is search and rescue missions and, and flying as, as a SAR crewman and a vertical replenishment crewman when I was in HC6 in, in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. But uh, all that flight time and everything, uh, you know, 90% of it is boring and 10% of it is pure adrenaline pumped unbelievable things happening and you got to think on your feet at, at any moment. But I think going through SAR school instills that bit of confidence in you that makes you able to do that. I mean, right. that's one of the things when, when I was an instructor at rescue swimmer school, that's, that's what we tried to teach everybody was to have that mind over matter. You know, you, you can do it. You sometimes you think you can't, but you really can. If you put your mind to it, you, you can, over accomplish a lot of a lot of difficulties. <laughs> Eric, uh, you're right on point with all of that. Is is because when you're put into that situation, you have to you have to dial it in and do your job. Stay focused. Do your job. Right. Yeah. Love it. Right. <laughs> Eric, did, like your first unit is was, was that your first unit? Uh, that last yeah, one? that was my very first command. Yep. So your very first unit, you get some um, heart wrenching and emotional rescues, you know, where it, things didn't work out to amazing rescues that were incredible. And now yeah. you go on to Point Magoo, California, <laughs> and you've got one out there. Yeah, too. yeah I've got, well, 
and in my long my long time being a rescue swimmer, I, uh, you know, it seems like I don't know. It's, fortunate or unfortunate a lot of times when things happen it seems like i always had the duty and uh um <laughs> you know i was in i was in meridian and one of my fellow crewmen was there at the same time i was and he never went on a rescue mission you know just flights and things like that and i went on many many ones so it's all luck of the draw or just happenstance i guess yeah but, yeah, I was up for I was up for orders, and uh, I called the detailer because back then there was no message traffic or anything. You know, I, I mean, as far as talking to your detailer, you got on the phone and you called him, and you waited and tried to get in touch with him to come up with orders, and he would offer you three or four things, and you got to pick from them, or he just told you where you were going. Well, uh, uh, NAS Meridian back then. When I, when I was stationed there, I called him and he was at, in, in, uh, that's when, uh, Navy personnel command was in DC. Um, I called him and he said, uh, well, uh, we're gonna send you out to Point Magoo, California. And, you know, for us, we have what's called a seashore rotation. You have so many years on sea duty, then so many years on shore duty. Okay. And shore, shore duty is where you're non-deployable. Sea okay. duty is you could go on a deployment of any kind up to a year or six months, whatever it was back then. I think ours were nine months back then, but I, I asked him, I said, well, what kind of sea duty is in Point New California? And he said, there is no sea duty. That's shore duty. I said, I'm coming off of shore duty. He goes, I know you are. And you're going to Point New California. I said, well, what's going on? And he said, well, whatever reason, I'm not sure, but all the air crewmen had quit out there. For some reason, oh, there was a uh, turmoil between them and the civilians because the Point Magoo, California, NAS Point Magoo is right next to VXE six, which is the the unit that goes to Antarctica with their bright orange helicopters. And there's rescue swimmers there too. Okay, but all the civilians had uh, uh, something had gone on, and all the crewmen had quit. So anybody that had H four six experience, and at that point I had a thousand hours and forty sixes, and they said, "You're going, you're going out there." And I said, "Okay." They're orders. They're not. They're not suggestions. So uh, <laughs> I went to. That's kind of the way the military works. And, Come on, we're gonna tell you where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I got out there, and it was it was pretty nice. I mean, it was really nice, just wonderful flying and lots of things going on. But uh, one day when we had uh, duty, uh, and I had duty. It was a call that the uh, boat had sunk about two miles out in the ocean off of uh, right off of the base. And, and, and I that, have uh, this one in front of me, actually, because you got a, it. Yeah, you got a citation for this, like a, a rescue citation directly from uh, or another one, I should say, directly from uh, yeah. Boeing. And, and I'll, let me let me read this. because right. It's a short little sweet, you know. Like right off, but rescue citation sure. in recognition for meritorious service. The Boeing Verdal Company presents this certificate to AMS3, Eric Williamson, swimmer, a crew member who demonstrated outstanding professionalism during a hoist rescue of a survivor from a wreckage of his fishing boat two nautical miles south-southwest of NAS Point Magoo, California on 20 May 1981. Yeah! Way to go yeah. with the details there, Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I was always, I sent you a picture of my, uh, of uh, my name tag. It's got a lot of my, uh, those pins on it, you know. Yeah. If you do, a, if you do a rescue in a helicopter, I, I mean, Boeing and Bell and Sikorsky all give these, at least I used to back then, give out these pins for a rescue swimmer. If you w went on a rescue mission, you saved somebody's life, you'd get a, a rescue citation and a pin and you can do whatever you want to with a pin. A lot of people put them on a plaque or whatever. I, I put all mine on my name tag for a while. Yep. <clears throat> um, when uh, we went on that mission, we launched and we went searching for it. And, and some boats had radioed into the Coast Guard, but the Coast Guard was up in Ventura, California. It was going to take them too long to get down there. So they asked us to go. So we launched and went out there and we we're flying around to the general location. Uh, and anybody that's in SAR knows you do an expanding square type search from the last known location 
yep. and you do set up a search grid and you try to start searching and everybody's looking out different sides of the helicopter and lo and behold we fly out there and it takes us about maybe 10 minutes flying around and we find this guy and he's floating in this uh uh it, it's it's pretty you see them they're square they're maybe about four foot square it's got netting in it and it's it's a flotation thing and it's kind of like a, a a very cheap uh survival flotation device okay and he's sitting in it i could see him so uh we do a 10 and 10 i jump out and i swim over to the guy and as i'm swimming over to the guy he's drinking a beer and i was like <laughs> this is the craziest thing i have ever seen and uh as i swim up to him i I kind of do a quick reverse in the water and I get maybe about eight, 10 away, feet away from him. Now the helicopter's flowing away and they're kind of circling a very large circle away from us so I can talk to this guy. And I say, what's going on? And how you doing? You okay? And I go through the standard questions and it's obvious this guy's had uh, more than enough to drink. And uh, they I usually said, uh, well, do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't, said, let, uh, don't let the alcohol right, go bad. Let's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why well, he had a he had a partial six pack in him in the boat in the little life raft with him, and uh, I said, uh, "Look, you got, I got to get you. You got to get you out of that thing, so I can get you over here underneath the hoist. We can hoist you up." And he said, "Nope, I ain't going." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, you are going." And he said, "Nope, I don't think so." And uh, I said, "Look, you know." It's getting cold out here. It's going to get dark pretty soon. I said, uh, tides, the tides going out. You're not going towards shore. You're going away from shore. I said, you're going to end up in Mexico somewhere. I said, uh, <laughs> it's best if you let me get out of that raft and, and get in the water with me and, uh, let me hoist you up. He said, uh, that ain't happening. I ain't getting in the water. Thought for a second. I said, okay. I said, I'll tell you what. I got these fins. Maybe I can get up in there with you and I can paddle and we can paddle towards the shore and uh, uh, we'll get out on the beach. I said, how about that? He said, that sounds like a good idea. I said, okay. So I swam up to the raft and I reached my hand up there and I said, help me up in. And he <laughs> made the mistake of giving me his hand. So instead of him pulling me in, I, I pulled him in the water. So yes. once I got him in the water, it was he was on he was in my my area then, and then I was able to get a hold of him and get him in a cross chest carry and uh, pull him over to away from the raft. He was pretty upset with me, but uh, <laughs> once again, all that rescue swimmer training came in, and I was able to keep a hold of him long enough to get him over there and get him hooked up to the hoist and get him up in the helicopter, and then let the crew or let the corpsman. Uh, evaluate him and uh determine that he was just a little hypothermic and a very much drunk <laughs> and uh so we got him to uh uh we got him to into the into the hospital and landed in the ambulance met us at the at the flight line and he he went on his way but yeah point magoo is very interesting thing because we did a lot of uh lots and lots of civilian rescues uh the whole reason really at point magoo was uh to provide assistance to the pacific missile range facility they would launch these drones out over the pacific missile range and then the jets would would go out there and shoot missiles at them and shoot them down and then we'd go out and uh try to recover the drones yep and uh that was our primary mission, but SAR was secondary, but we did a lot more SAR than we did anything. Um, off of Point Magoo, they have the uh, Anacapa Islands, which are a series of islands out there, San, Santa Rosa, Santa Capa, those islands. Uh, yep. We got a phone call or we got a message, a tasker from the Coast Guard. There was a, a and back then, I don't remember the helicopter the Coast Guard was flying, but it didn't have the legs that we had. It couldn't go as far as we could. It's, uh, it was either the H3 or the H52. I think it was the I, H52. It was, yeah. I'm dating myself you know what? here, but it was, I, it was I, a smaller version. Of the yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to go with H52, and I apologize for all the guys, my old school swimmers, that are like, 
you should know this, Quinny. I'm sorry. I flew the H60 and the H65. So that was not my helicopter. Yeah. But I remember the H3 being the big one. I believe it was the H52 was a small one in the in the small yeah. units. It, I, I want to say they didn't have the legs to get to it, and they asked us to go. And a lot Close. of our taskers came from them, but we were really, we were really good friends with the guys uh, from the Coast Guard there because we we every year we'd have we'd have a softball game together where we played each other, and then oh, we'd have nice. a big we'd go to their place to have the softball game, and they'd buy all the food and the beer, and then we'd have them come down to our place, and uh, we'd have a big. Uh, big picnic and a big food for everybody and so we were really really in close contact with each other all the time because everything in that area was our mission either us or them and we really it was their mission and we supported them yeah and a lot of the rescues that we got were direct result of the coast guard calling us and saying hey can you take this one our bird is flying north to santa barbara can you go do this one and one of the times we got a call about a, a uh uh, a fishing trawler that was off the coast quite a ways had uh, had a crewman that had gotten a uh, had gone into a uh, had a seizure or something was wrong with him and they needed a medevac so uh, we we flew out there but of course we flew to I want to say San Clemente Island I'm not sure the name of the island if I'm getting that right or not but we flew out there and it was probably our flight out there to that island and then once we got there we refueled and then it was another hour out to the boat to the ship and when we and it was a fishing trawler not a really big one but anybody that's done done this really tells you that some of these boats you go to you look at them and you're like how in the world are we going to get down through all that rigging all those lines all those cables all those booms get on board that ship to help these people yeah. And uh, the only way we could get on board this one boat was to actually lower the and, and lower the Stokes litter and, the, and, the, and me, the crewman, down on top of the pilot house and then crawl down off the pilot house, get down onto the boat. And, and that's actually what we did. Strapped him in the Stokes litter. And then with the crewman, then we actually got him up to the on top of the uh pilot house and they were then able to hook up to him and we were able to to pick him up and uh, get him in the helicopter but one of the things from back then is if if you start cpr you can't stop it you right. can't just say okay i'm tired i'm done right uh, right uh, yeah there was me i was the rescue swimmer the crew chief and the corpsman that was with us at the time we uh they had started CPR on him when we picked him up. So we got him up into the helicopter and, uh, you know, we're beelining back, but of course we got to stop and re refuel before we can get into the, to the beach. So we had to stop and refuel and then we're flying. So it's probably two and a half hours from when we picked him up and got him in the helicopter until we actually got him back to the, oh my to the base. Gosh. And we did we did CPR on him the entire time, the whole oh way. Oh my I mean, god! This is this is before face masks or uh, you know this was mouth to mouth old yeah. school CPR. Oh uh, man! For two and a half hours, the three of us, and I can tell you when we got him, when we got him back, we were give out, unbelievable. We were just exhausted by the time we got him back and yeah. uh yeah i, I don't so think, much so that i don't think people understand exactly how much uh like how exhausted you really get from doing extended amount of cpr you know um i had a case where i was i was doing cpr for like 45 minutes so i understand exactly what you're at you're I me mean, you're dripping sweat you're drenched you're you're cranking yep. on a chest. You're trying to breathe. You're trying to do everything that's right. I mean, when you, when three guys are doing it over a two hour period, that is exhaustion. Plus you still got to do your exhaustion. regular. Yeah. You got to do your regular yeah. like, flight duties too. Don't forget that. So you have to be mentally in the game and flight duties and medicine duties. Crazy. I, I, I equate uh, doing CPR in a situation like that 
to being in a car accident for two and a half hours on stop. Just the point where your adrenaline is pumping and, and the psychological aspect of it and the physical aspect of it is, is intense to do CPR and knowing that that guy's, you're trying to save this person's life and you're doing the CPR, but the whole time, uh, you know, the Pacific ocean is very cold. Yeah. So, you know, if you're in the Gulf coast or in, in Key West or someplace like that, you can jump in what's called an old school shorty, you know, which is a, a short wetsuit. It's got a, a it's like short sleeves and the short yeah. breeches and it's just a one piece. Well, back then I had booties, a farmer, John on the wetsuit top, uh, you know, the hood, the gloves, everything when I went down because it's so cold. Yep. And uh, so I'm doing CPR with this guy with a full wetsuit on for two and a half hours. And <laughs> when we got, I was soaking wet with sweat. Um, Jeez, oh man. When we got back, when we got back to the base, I, I actually laid on the flight line by the SAR shack and they, they put a garden hose on me and were washing me off trying to, you know, the corpsman was, Swear to God, he was going to send. He was trying to send me to the hospital, get an IV myself, because he thought I was going to pass out. But <laughs> it took like it took two other crewmen to pull my wetsuit off of me because I was we were I was just been sweating nonstop, you know, like running a marathon for two and a half hours with a full wetsuit on. It was it was pretty intense. It really was. Wow, unreal! Holy smoke! <laughs> you know, but you can go two months just doing your job and then next thing you know bam you got to do do something like this it's 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 uh yeah it makes you it makes you uh think about what you're doing for a living and and the importance of it is really really gets to you every once in a while oh absolutely you know I, and then there's two aspects of the whole idea of this and that is the physical and then the mental like the physical side is relatively easy. As long as you have a little bit of motivation and dedication, go to the gym every day, you know, get on a treadmill, throw some weights around, bring your cardio level up so that you're not sucking wind when you're getting called. Then it's been a two month period of time or, or whatever the, the length of time is to go save somebody. But then the other side of it is the mental side of it. So, you know, keeping up on your skills, your rescue skills, your medic skills, your whatever you're tasked with, you got to keep that up as well. And, you know, again, if you go two months without touching a patient, you better be training in between just yep. as much as you are yep. with maybe right. all your other stuff. So I can't emphasize so, it enough. So. Uh, Jack, I told you about Jack Stiley. He, he influenced me greatly when I was a very young E1, E2, whatever, you know, E3 when I was just coming up and I first met him because like most E3s, we're, you know, full of ourselves and uh, kind of wandering aimlessly and in needing yeah. of some serious direction. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he pulled, he, when I shortly after I got there, he could tell I was uh, uh, I was not as dedicated or motivated to do what I was supposed to do, I guess, as most airmen or most E3s aren't. He pulled me aside and he kind of got me behind a Quonset hut, which is where we kept all the oil. And uh, he got he got up close and personal with me and told me that uh, he could tell I was going to, I could do great things and I was going to go a long way if I got my mind right. He said, if you don't get your mind right, you're not going to make it. You're going to, you're going to get out of the Navy. You're going to go on and who knows what you're going to do. He said, but you've got to get your mind right. This is not a game. This yeah. is a job. This is serious. You've got to be serious about this. And he said, he, he kind of, he gave me a lot of direction and guidance. What a lot of us got when we were juniors, sailors, or coast guardies, uh, coasties, I guess is what you call them. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> ask the dispersion towards my coast guard friends, but. No, um, you're good. <laughs> no. Hey, listen, he really, you know hold he on. Really, let's, let's throw this out there real quick for everybody. And that is, uh. It, the Navy boys make fun of the Coast Guard guys. The Coast Guard guys make fun of the Navy boys. But you know what? When we get together, we're in the same job. We're doing the same thing. We're saving lives. Absolutely. It doesn't matter. But if we're not making fun of each other, then we don't love each other. That's all there is to it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah, uh, but he, he kind of 
he kind of set me on a path to make sure I knew what I was doing and I knew how to do it the right way and to be ready to do it. You could be walk. I could, I could have been in the hangar deck sweeping uh, something and he grabbed me and say, let's go. we got a mission. And you got maybe just a few minutes to grab your gear and get your mind right. You better be ready to do it. Right. And that's what training is all about. That's why you continually trained and, and worked out to be physically aspect of it. But the mental aspect of it is, is, is just as taxing, if not more. A hundred percent agree. Absolutely. So nice. All yeah. right, my friend. Well, from there, what, cause you had, you just had an incredible career that, I mean, starting from basically E1 all the way to E10 yep. or E9, I guess. Yeah, E9. 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 Yeah. Yeah. E9. Uh, I'll tell you the scariest mission I ever went on uh, was in Point Magoo as well. Uh, we, uh, we got launched to go to a uh, oil, and I, I don't want to say it was a, it's an old, you know, California was banning a lot of oil production off the coast. So this was a, <clears throat> a dock, and they wanted us to fly out to this uh, – steel platform and to meet these people who were going to pull their boat up there. And this person that was sick was going to climb out onto the dock and then we were going to pick them up, but it was too small. You couldn't land on it. <clears throat> and, uh, it was a tradition, traditional California morning, you know, foggy, little cold and that thick fog, not the kind of fog that is kind of rainy fog. You don't know if it's raining or actually foggy. It's in between. Yeah. And uh, one of the un unknown killers of a helicopter is static electricity. Yeah. And uh, I learned that day exactly what it was all about. Because <laughs> we, we flew out to this, we flew out to this uh, steel platform and uh, <clears throat> we, the boat was tied up to the platform. And this platform was maybe about 20 feet off the top of the water. And it was kind of a, a deserted uh, oil deck kind of like thing. It was just flat, nothing on it, piles sticking up out of the water. So they hoisted me down, and I was going to uh, put the person in the horse collar, bring them up. But as we lowered down, uh, the second that – and and – they used to have what was called a static electricity. When you hoist a lot to a lot of ships, what they'll do is they'll take a, a long wire and hook it to the deck and then they have a big hook. Yep. And when they're coming down, they'll actually touch that hook to the wire. So the static electricity is discharged and it, it doesn't discharge into anybody. Well, right. on that day, there was nobody there. So I, my feet touched down, but, and I had a hold of the collar and I was trying to make it so that the cable didn't touch me and would actually go on the deck and discharge static electricity. But unfortunately the wind or whatever kind of made that cable <laughs> <clears throat> swing around and, it, and it, it touched me on the shoulder. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> I remember the shock and then I remember opening my eyes <laughs> and as I was opening my eyes, I was at the door of the helicopter. Oh, and what wow. had happened was that that static, that static electricity had discharged through my shoulder, through my body, and out all the static electricity that built up that helicopter to H-46, and it knocked me slap out. I mean, it knocked me out. And then when I came to, I was at the helicopter door, and the crew, the crew chief was reaching out to grab me to pull me back in. And, you know, I was – it kind of – it knocked me for a loop. And, then, and and he ended up putting the corpsman on the – I had got inside, and they sat me down, and they put the corpsman on the hoist, lowered him down put it, so he could get the person on the horse collar. But <clears throat> you uh, – flying in a helicopter is is a dangerous environment. They try to make them as safe as possible. You work on them yourself. You make them as, as best you possibly can to make sure that they're uh, mechanically sound. But yeah. – uh, that day I learned really quickly that, that life can be very fickle and uh, at any moment things can go bad. And, and, and that morning they did. It, 
Like I can remember it vividly. Yeah. So I have been hit multiple times underneath the helicopter. Uh, for those that have not ever been hit as far as that electrical shock, it's only a matter of time. It will happen. There's tips and tricks to make it better or worse. But uh, I, I've never been knocked out. So that way, you got me on that one, Eric. I will, You can have that one up. Uh, I'm all good for that. I don't want to get knocked nah. out. <laughs> You can you can have that one. I don't I don't want it. Uh, it's, that's it my hurts. one time and only time. I've been shocked, you know, vert ripping and and that. Every once in a while, you'll get a little ting or a little yeah. twinge. You, yep. you feel it, but it's nothing. Nothing. The environmental conditions have to be just right, so that helicopter has generated the max amount of elect static electricity or electricity that it could possibly have. And it's just looking for some place to let it go. And, <laughs> and it, just, uh, it was you that day. So happened, it was me. <laughs> yeah, it sure was. Uh, Definitely was. Which way to go? Which way to go? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. That's terrible. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> All right, Eric. Well, I can tell you, uh, keep, keep us rolling because I am, I am loving every bit of this. Okay. I can, uh, well, when I left there, I, I left Point Magoo. We did a lot of mountain, and I say mountain, but it's not really mountains like people think of mountains. You know, off the coast of California, there's uh, uh, large hills when you get towards Camarillo and places like that and hikers and things like that. There's a lot of those kind of, you know, pickups and things like that and a lot of medevacs and, and that. Um, but from there, I left. Went to uh, HC-6 in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, which is a uh, H-46 squadron. But that was all going on deployments and, and going out um, on different type ships, mostly for uh, vertical replenishment. But nice. at the same token, uh, at the same time, there's a search and rescue aspect of it. And a lot of your training comes into play when uh, – like I said, when things go the worst, I was on the USS Santa Barbara and we had two helicopter detachment. I was on the Santa Barbara and our, our sister detachment was on the Savannah, USS Savannah. Okay. The Santa Barbara being an AFS, which was a supply ship and the Savannah being an AOE, which is a, uh, uh, our AOR oiler replenishment, uh, their two crew detachment. We were both, we were all off the coast of Diego Garcia. And let me tell you something. Diego Garcia is in the middle of nowhere. It's off the uh, uh, eastern coast of Africa in the middle of the ocean, so far away from anything. It's just a little tiny clump of little island way out in the middle of nowhere. We were off the coast of that. And we were transporting passengers from Diego Garcia that would fly in on, on C-141s. Okay. And then we would pick the passengers up and take them out on board our ships and then we would transit towards the aircraft carrier which was the america at the time and then we would pick up uh the crew or the passengers and then transport them to the america and uh we uh uh we the savannah had just landed in one of their birds both of our birds were on diego garcia picking somebody up one of the Savannah birds was on board the Savannah and one had landed on our ship. And on that day, I wasn't flying. Uh, I was the LSC landing signalman uh, for the uh, calling the helicopter in and landing it on deck. Okay. And the Savannah crew had just picked up, came on board, picked up 16 passengers and was just taking off and going to head out towards the America. But once they lift off and they start heading out, within about 15 seconds, you know that they're gone and you can kind of start, you know, gearing down per se. Well, the helicopter took off and left. Probably didn't get out maybe 15 seconds and all of a sudden it turned around and started coming back. And I looked up at the control tower, which is not very far above you on the ship. And I looked up at him and he just kind of put his hands up in the air. I said, okay. So I started signaling them in <clears throat> and I saw a large amount of smoke coming out of the uh, right side of the helicopter. Oh, yeah. Come on. I said, uh oh. I said, yeah, something serious is going on. Well, they came in, and there's a, there's a certain element to helicopters. And anybody that's in, that flies them knows 
once you reach a certain point, you're hovering in ground effect and over the water, that's not a good thing. You always want some forward mobility. <clears throat> Anything higher, you kind of there's a there's a tipping point. You're good and bad really quickly. He yeah. got to that point where he was bad. He got to that point where he was bad and he just dropped and he ended up crashing onto the back of the ship. But the middle of the helicopter with the front half on the ship and the back half off the ship. So uh, we knew that there were uh, 16 passengers, two crewmen and two pilots on that helicopter. We well, hit the back of the ship and kind of started to vibrate very bad and, and dance around. And then it fell off to the starboard side of the ship and went into the water. Oh, and when it went into God. the water, it kind of, it kind of busted in half. And when it busted in half, you could see heads start popping up out of the water. And, and we're all standing there trying to count them. And uh, they said, you know, launch the SAR boat because there's no helicopters around. It's us and them. We, yeah. it's like a fire on a ship. You can't run away from a fire on a ship because there's nowhere to go. Right. Out there, there's no one to save you. You got to do what we need to do. So I remember throwing my uh, life vest off or throwing my uh, float coat off and running to the, sh to this, uh, the SAR or the boat they're going to put in the water, which is just a small rib, really. And uh, as I ran by, I grabbed my SAR bag, which I kept in the hangar deck, jumped in the boat and we lowered down and we were able to get out there. And we ended up picking up uh, 15 passengers, two crewmen and two pilots. And wow. we lost one, they lost one passenger on the entire, and, and we're really lucky we didn't lose more. But the whole, when we got back on board the ship, the crewman, one of them being a very junior crewman, was really, really shaken up by that. And uh, he ended up shortly after that quit flying and he wasn't going to fly anymore because it had shaken him up so bad. Yeah. And that's, you know, a lot of my emphasis on this and talking to you is about the training that you go through and the, the mind over matter and compartmentalizing a lot of those things. Because for any of us, if we go through a traumatic event, it's the ability to revert back to what you've been taught and to put it behind you and to continue on and do the job. And at that point, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty traumatic for a lot of us and everybody, but yeah. it really shook him up bad so much so that he ended up quit flying at that point. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was pretty tough. It was yeah. pretty tough watching that happen. Wow. You know, and, and there's, kind there's two sides of that, that that really sound, you know, it, terrible tragedy like lose an aircraft goes in the drink you know the post-traumatic stress that comes out of that accident itself and at the other side of it you saved everybody but one person in a major accident in a major yeah that's pretty freaking good like hats off to again you guys that are the response team the, the boat to get in the water and, and get everybody out that's like that's saying something so yeah, it was, it was, you talk, it's, you know, anybody has been out, you know, we play fun with the Coast Guard all the time because you guys stay closer to land and yeah. never really <laughs> very, very far away from land. Hey, I but, don't want to get, I don't want to go past my knees, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> uh, out in the middle of the Indian Ocean at night, you know, when it's just getting dark and it was going to be our last flight because you can't, you can't haul or you can't transport passengers in dark at nighttime past sunset. Okay. Uh, that's a regulation. You can only fly with crewmen and that's it. No passenger transfers. So shortly after that wreck, it got dark. And by the time we got the boat in the water and we're actually out to the, uh, to the wreckage, which was really close to the ship because the ship went still in the water. Uh, it was dark at that point and the eeriness of it and the, the ship, right there in the helicopter kind of floating kind of not floating and heads bobbing up and down in the water and yeah it's uh it, it's 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 pretty traumatic event to say the least but yeah if wow. everybody hadn't been on the top of their game they probably would have lost a lot more people but we did we really 
And it wasn't me. All I did was jump into the boat with them and help pull guys in. It wasn't, you know, I didn't use any of my rescue swimmer techniques or anything like that. I didn't have to get in the water. Uh, it was all about all of us coming together as a team to try to save these people. And, and we ended up saving everybody but, but one person who uh, unfortunately lost his life in it. Yeah, that's, I mean, again, tragedy and, and the silver lining of, it, of the other side of it, you know, saving 15. Um, and I'm all about it. Like the full, full, it takes an entire team to get that something like that done. And, you know, I have personally never experienced something that dramatic and I'm, I'm good. Like, I mean, I'm happy to do it, but if you, again, you just, you might be just one guy jumping in a boat, but you're one guy that's jumping in a boat with five other guys that are jumping in a boat going to do the same thing. Like everybody wants to go out there and, and help. And that's, what's awesome. Yep. That's why we do what we do. Yeah. Love it. Right. Wow. Well, Eric, when wow. I, I left, I left HC six and uh, I got orders to HC 16 in Pensacola, Florida. And uh, Pensacola is a great place to be stationed. It's just a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful place. I've been down there once or twice. Well, with that, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. When, when I was there, when I was there, there was no. Uh, and this, this is. Uh, there was no Coast Guard anywhere around there. Not even anywhere close. <clears throat> we were it. I think okay. the closest Coast Guard was in Mobile, Alabama. Yeah, training and, unit uh, as well. So. Yeah. So we were it back then. And, and uh, I mean, 99.9% .9 of all of the missions that we went on were civilian related. Very, very, very few of them were actually military related. They were all civilian rescues, sailboats or a boat in distress or uh, a swimmer swept too far out in the riptide, uh, those types of rescues. But it always seemed like once a month, that's what we were doing. Uh, I mean, there was, and during the summertime, it could have been every day or every other day you were going on some kind of mission to, to do that. Yeah. Uh, it's a really good diving spot too. So we would get a lot of calls to go out and pick up uh, uh, divers that had gotten the bends and fly them to uh, Fort Walton beach where they have the big uh, Navy. Uh, uh, I don't want to say iron lung, but they got no, the I, decompression, de de decompression chamber. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Decompression yeah. chamber. Yeah. Rolling at a thousand <laughs> so feet would, off the water, 500 to a thousand feet yep. off the water, just rolling in. Oh yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we'd go out there and pick them up because the Navy dive school was in Fort Wall beach. Uh, somewhere out there. I want to say it was where Navy dive school was at. So we would pick them up and bring them to that uh, decompression uh, chamber and uh, um, so it was, it was, uh, that was three years of, uh, of a lot of civilian medevacs and, and a few rescues, you know, I rescued a, um, a family off a, a sailboat that had, uh, they had gotten too close to the, right off the coast there is a ship, it's called the, it's a sunken battleship, it's USS Massachusetts. And uh, it's a World War One battleship, but now it's yeah. a dive location where they sank it purposely for people to go diving on. Okay. But a sailboat had gotten too, too close to it and uh, uh, gotten a lot of problems, and it ended up going under. And when we got out there, there was a three, I think three, three or four family members just floating in the water. And that was my uh, that was my very first H one rescue. I was uh, I just happened to be the rescue swimmer on that crew and go out there and just. And I want to say, you know, routine rescue, none of them are routine, but routine rescue, just lower down, jump out of a helicopter and put them on the hoist, host them up, jump back in the water and do it four times and get them all back to dry land. And, uh, Damn, come on, Eric. Very, very, <laughs> yeah, uh, very first H1 rescue. That's, yes, yes. All this time and then, boom, water rescue off Pensacola. A couple people yeah. in the water. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now you were uh, you were in charge of the school there as well, right? Right. Well, I I received I when I left Pensacola, I went to the USS Saipan and flew oh. H ones on the Saipan for three years. Um, that was that was pretty much standard ships company flying, you know, packs and mail and transports and flying 
you know, starboard delta quite a lot. Any Navy guy will tell you exactly what starboard delta is. You fly on the starboard side and you flew with a delta flight pattern. You just fly around in a big circle on the starboard side of the ship yeah. while they do flight ops, hoping that nothing happens and, you know, wondering if anything ever will happen. But yeah. that was three years of that. But uh, when I left there, by the time I left there, I was, I'd, I'd made chief, I'd made E7. And uh, when I was leaving the, uh, there, I got orders to uh, aviation aircrew candidate school in Pensacola. But uh, when I got there, uh, the mass chief that was there said, we're sending you down to rescue swimmer school because you're a rescue swimmer. A lot of times in manpower, they, they say you have to have 100 people in your command, but they don't tell you what to do with them when you get there. And this oh. was the case. Once I, once I got to aviation schools command, instead of working at Air Crew Canada School, they said, you're going to rescue swimmer school. I said, okay. So, uh, yes, Master Chief. <laughs> That's exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, Master yeah. Chief. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Master Chief. I went down to aviation <laughs> rescue swimmer school. Yeah, exactly. Went down to aviation rescue swimmer school and uh, had to go through. The first thing I had to go through was uh, rescue swimmer instructor training. So in rescue swimmer instructor training, in order to be a rescue swimmer instructor, at that point, a lot of things had transpired in the rescue swimmer community so that the SAR model manager had changed some aspects of it that you had to have a physical, you had to have the physical attributes, but you had to have the mental attributes and the common sense in order to be instructor. Okay. Uh, so they sent you to rescue swimmer instructor training. So in that training, you had to do everything that a student had to do and then on top of that, be able to teach it. So however tough rescue swimmer school was, rescue swimmer instructor school was that plus. Wow. So here I am at this point. Uh, I'm not sure how old I was, but uh, <laughs> it, was, it was tough. It was really tough. A lot of the instructors that were going there were E5s or E6s, and here I was uh, – an E7 going through that class, and uh, it was hard. It was really hard, but I, I made it through it, and then I went to rescue swimmer school, and I was the student control chief, which is, uh, the, I think, is a progression once you get there. Yep. Uh, there's uh, four, you know, four chiefs and a senior chief there. Senior chief uh, was Chris Mitchell at the time. I called him Torque. He was nice. a uh, very big uh, – uh, black man who was uh, very intimidating, but a, just a, a wonderful, wonderful man who I, I became great friends with while I was there. He was the LCPO and I was a student control chief for about the first year I was there. And then I made senior chief. And then uh, uh, Chris got orders to leave and go somewhere else. And I became the LCPO. So I was the LCPO there from uh, 90, uh, I want to say 94 and 95 until I, I uh, transferred. And that was really my very last rescue swimmer uh, role because when I left there, I had made senior chief and I was looking to try to make master chief. And the orders that were offered to me at the time were pretty much, look, you can go back to a squadron, you can go to uh, back to sea duty and uh, you'll be in a squadron with a whole bunch of other people. and you're probably just going to be a crewman and they got a lot of ground pounders, which are non crewmen that got the good jobs. You know, it's very hard for you to make master chief. So at that point, my detailer pretty much said, look, I can send you back to Norfolk or I can send you to your rating detailer and, and you can make a decision. So I ended up going back to my rating detailer and uh, ended up getting orders to uh, row to Spain, which I never would have got as a rescue swimmer because you're very right. limited when you're a rescue swimmer as to where you can go for orders. So, yeah. but, uh, Rescue Swimmer School was a whole bunch of things that people just don't understand all the aspects of that school and what transpires and what, what you're going through and yeah. the amount of scrutinization that's placed on everything, the amount of uh, safety protocols that are put in place, the amount of training that the instructors go through and the amount of oversight. Uh, uh, a lot of people think it was – it was loose and goose, but it was definitely not. I um, uh, went to training with the uh, SAR model manager's office in Jacksonville quite often, 
to make sure we were following the curriculum to the letter. You yeah. know, there's no deviation from that curriculum whatsoever. Uh, they say it's a high risk training environment. And you probably don't remember this, but everybody that went through rest of swimmer school had to sign a release form that said they understood they were going through a high risk training environment and they potentially could uh, have drastic results from that. You know, you know what? I, I don't uh, remember signing something like that. <laughs> everybody did. Everybody did. There's two things that they nobody ever remembers. That's the fact that um, when you sign a contract and you come in the military or in the Navy specifically, there's a small, you, you know, you sign a lot of papers and you sign your enlistment contract. But there's one little line in there that says, if you fail to meet the training pipeline, you will be dealt at the needs of the Navy. You'll be detailed at the needs of the Navy. Yeah. Well, when somebody would, would drop out of rescue swimmer school, uh, when I was the LCPO, I, they would, for whatever reason, academically, physically, or just they dropped on request, they didn't want to do it anymore. Uh, I would get them in front of my desk and I would sit down, I'd go over things with them and I'd tell them what was going to transpire. And I'd say, uh, your orders have come in and, you are being dealt to the USS Trenton as an able-bodied seaman, a non-designated seaman. And they'd be like, what? Wait, wait, wait a second. I enlisted in the Navy to become an AW or to become a whatever. And I'd say, well, yes, but this one little caveat right here, which says in your enlistment contract, says if you fail to meet the training pipeline, you will be dealt, you will be detailed as the needs of the Navy. And the Navy needs you on the USS Trenton right now. And... Uh, <laughs> Talk about a heartbreaker for a lot of yeah, people. Um, yeah, got to read the that, that they did that, <laughs> Well, the reason that they did that back then and prior to that, AWs, Air Warfare, would go through Air Crew Candidate School and they realized that if I don't make it through Rescue Swimmer School, I get to be a, a P3 to AW. I get to go to AWA school and go be a P3 crewman and fly – on P3s and land at all these nice places and go to these nice hotels and things and never go on a ship. Oh. And if I make it to rescue swimmer school, I get to fly in a helicopter and go on board the ship's company. I think I'm going to not make it to rescue swimmer school. So in order to stop that, the Navy came up with the idea that, okay, if you, you fail to meet this training pipeline and you drop out of rescue swimmer school, you're not going to be an AW period. And it was a, uh, earth shattering for the AW community at that time when they came wow. out with that, that guidelines, but it stopped a lot of people from dropping out for the reason of getting an easier ride per yeah. se. Yeah. So interesting. Um, but our attrition rate at one point was 82%. It was the second highest attrition rate of anything in the Navy oh other than, goodness. other than the seals. Yeah. So we'd go to, uh, and, and, you know, one thing that was good about the Coast Guard, all the Coast Guard people that we trained, we had Coast Guard in every class we had. I don't think I ever, the entire time I was there, we did not have Coast Guard students in that classroom with us. Yeah, or in they, that training. They were because, there, like, and that, I mean, our school was your school. We would, we would be in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. We'd go through training there and then be sent to Navy Rescue Swimmers in Pensacola do I believe four weeks down there and then return to either East city or then go to your unit. I went through just Elizabeth city, North Carolina, so I didn't have to go to Pensacola, but um, yeah, you had a lot of coasties. <laughs> a lot of them, a lot of, so much so um, I had, we had a coast guard instructor on staff with us at rescue swimming school in Pensacola the entire time. And uh, we would, the Coast Guard, once they left, when they came from Elizabeth City, New Jersey, they were, and we went to Elizabeth City, New Jersey, a lot of times to coordinate with the, the Coast Guard school to let them know what we were training and what we were teaching on. And then we could see what they were doing. We could give them some critiques and help them understand what, what we were going to be doing down there so they could better prepare the students for when they got to rescue swimmer school. Yeah. When, uh, and per man, every Coast Guard rescue swimmer that showed up in rescue swimmer school was in better shape than any Navy student that started that class. Now, <laughs> a lot of the Navy guys, a lot of the Navy guys would surpass the Coast Guard guys in training, you know, become more physically fit and everything, but to a man, better swimmer, more physically fit, ready to, to meet the needs of the rescue swimmer school. 
the Coast Guard was better prepared, per se, well, than yeah. the Navy guys were. But we train them up pretty quickly and get everybody up to the same speed yeah. because uh, no one was left behind, and uh, we'd make sure the training got done pretty and intently. Then, but uh, but you, you got to remember as well is that, you know, the Coast Guard guys – were in a training, like they went through a training process prior to coming down. If I remember correctly, yeah. a lot of your guys, as far as Navy guys, they would be coming off deployment, off the ship, off this part, and go right to school. So, guys, yeah, that, I, I that, mean, look, that was that was in the yep, yeah, that was in the early when I was there. They all, everyone had to be an air crew candidate school graduate first. Yeah, so all okay. the Navy guys were going through air crew candidate school, and they were being trained up uh and physically trained to get to rescue swimmer school so they were coming in with some physical training but not as intense and not as much pool training as the coast guard guys were getting up in elizabeth city yeah by the time they got to rescue swimmer school right so they were more yeah you know, a lot of the coast guard guys were much better for the water but at that time we had coast guard navy and the marines were sending all their marine rescue swimmers down to rescue swimmer school as well so we were training the marines and then wow. while awesome. i was there we trained we trained some australian people we trained some saudi arabians uh uh yeah it was it was a lot of different things going on back then but a lot of coordination between the star model manager's office in in uh, jacksonville and then the rescue swimmers in elizabeth city new jersey and then uh, no, North Carolina, in, uh, Elizabeth City, California. North Carolina. I hope you out with that yeah, one. Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Yeah, no, not New Jersey. We was, uh, <laughs> or North Carolina. Yeah, not New Jersey. Oh, I, I've been there before. That's, uh, that's that's an interesting place. Uh, yeah. But we uh, 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 we do a lot of training with them and co coordination. So we go out and talk with SEAL people, and we'd have to go to these conferences with them because their attrition rate was like. Ours was 82, 83 percent. Theirs was like 92 to 95 percent. Wow. And when I say attrition rate, out of, out of every 100 people to start the school, if you have an 82 percent attrition rate, uh, every 100 people to start school, 82 of them are going to be dropped for yeah. one reason or another. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of things. And, and we would talk to them about what they were treating and what, what their mental aspects of trying to teach these people how to do things and we would do the same and try to instill some of the things that they had learned on how to do it into rescue swimmer school. So it was a constantly evolving schoolhouse, but at the same time being very cautious and very understanding that there was no deviation from that curriculum whatsoever. We followed that thing to the letter of the law. And I, I'm happy to say that during my time there, uh, from the day I checked in till the day I checked out, we uh, nobody was hurt, nobody was injured, nothing ever transpired. But we had multiple, multiple safety observers and and a minimum of every scenario that was ever transpired had an E seven or above actually standing around watching it to make sure everything that was being done was because you have oversight and then oversight of the oversight. That's all part of it. Yeah. Because it is a high risk training environment. You don't want anybody getting hurt. Agreed. Yeah, I totally agreed. Uh, you know, and, and it's just the idea behind the rescue swimmer school stuff is, is to push yourself physically and mentally to where you don't think you can go. And then you keep going and you collect yourself and do the job, do the job, do your job. That's it. Yeah, do your job. You know, do your job. It, it's funny. We you, know, you always teach them, look, when you're in the ocean, there's nowhere to go. It, yeah. You've got to do the job. If you're going to, if you've got to do the job, there's no saying I can't, I won't. You got people in the water and you fly up in a helicopter and you got to jump out the door and you see it's the middle of the night and it's water temperature is uh, below freezing and it's, 35 degrees outside and there's, you know, 10 foot waves and, you know, you, you can't sit in the door and say, I'm not going to do it. Right. I'm not going to jump. You've got to do what your job is to do it. And it takes, it takes a special person to be able to understand as our motto is. So others may live that, that 
you're doing your job so that other people will will live and you're going to save somebody's life by doing it. That's what it's all about. Exactly. As Thor Wentz would say, keep your composure and finish the job. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh, you know, and there's a lot of crewmen that went before me and a lot of crewmen, lots and lots and lots of crewmen that have gone after me. Yeah. And things have changed in, in the SAR community so much uh, over the past you know, if, if two years from right now is going to be completely different than it is right now, because yeah. things are constantly evolving, constantly changing, new types of helicopters, new type of equipment, new type of, uh, uh, you know, they got, the Coast Guard's got FLIR and uh, yeah. infrared scanning and things like that. We had flashlights and loudspeakers. That's what we had. It wasn't. There's, they just you don't have the technological <laughs> advances that you have nowadays right? back then. And you know, uh five, ten years from now, they're gonna have stuff that that you and I would go, I can't believe that that ever came about, but it's gonna happen. Yeah. Things are gonna change, things are gonna go differently. I as mean, I it went should to, too, as it should. Like we right. should be Absolutely. seeing this. So when when uh the old rescue swimmer school in Pensacola, where we were at, was on the beachfront. Uh, you know, you and I talked earlier about the rescue swimmer reunion that we've been having every two years now. Yeah. And we call it a worldwide rescue swimmer reunion because really anybody that was involved with the rescue swimmer community as a, as a maintainer, as a pilot, as a crewman, as a rescue swimmer, as a corpsman, Marine, Coast Guard, it doesn't matter, can come to this reunion that we have in Pensacola every two years. It just so happens this coming April is the next one. Um, we get the opportunity to go back to the Rescue Swimmer School in Pensacola, the new one where the new building is. Nice. And the changes that they go, that if, when you walk in there, the first thing you get is that overpowering chlorine smell. That, <laughs> that man, you talk about you, instantaneously, you start sweating thinking about getting in that pool. <laughs> oh it's, my God, that's so I don't true. Know what it is. I don't, you know, it's they, they pump the chlorine into that water so much because so many people are in the water. But when you walk back in there, it's like, you know, uh, I don't know. You have, you have deja vu instantaneously. Right. It's like, Oh my God, I'm back here, you know, and you, you smell that smell and you hear the water and you, you hear the instructors yelling. And, but when we went back there and we stood on the pool deck and watched them, you know, I know we're old guys now, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't mind telling I'm 62 years old right now. And I, I go back and stand on that pool deck. And I think back to when I was 18 years old going through rescue swimmer school and seeing the things that happened when I went through school to when I was the LCPO there to now and see the changes. And it just, it's just eye opening the facilities and the, and the things that they have at that school now are just, it's unbelievable. The, the level of training that they receive now, it's just phenomenal. Yeah. I, I envy the guys that are going through it now from when we went through it, I was getting trained by a bunch of Vietnam uh, guys, you know, rescue swimmers from Vietnam that were yeah. swimming around with knives in their mouths and stuff like that when they were doing <laughs> rescues. To, uh, to the modern, the modern age where they have cameras in their video and everything that's going on all the time, so they can go back and and look at it, critique the individual and how they did their rescue swimmers and how they did their rescues and things like that in the pool. That's light years from what we were doing back when I was going through, or even when I was the LCPO at the school. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I'm all about it too. It's, it's interesting. Can I say grr, by the way, like a knife in the mouth. Grr. Grr. Come on, yeah. there, Amy. Let's go. I, 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 said, <laughs> I said, I said, I said a lot more than that when I first saw those guys in the pool. <laughs> oh man. Sorry. Sorry. I'm picking on you. It's, it's, the, it's, the, oh, you, it's the love. Come on. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Oh, it's funny, man, Eric. These uh, all your stories and everything you've been talking about today is just like ridiculous. It's amazing. You you've had an incredible career, and I and I know like that was your last rescue swimmer unit being uh, being there at, at school and watching the young guys come up and training them to 
to deal with what you know they're going in to deal with. That's the other thing about this is like, you know, we're at, you get to a stage in your career where you have seen it, you've done it. And now how do you instill that into the next generation, the younger guys that, that don't understand what they're actually being asked to, to do, you know, in that 10, 20 foot, yeah. 30 foot wave in that, the boat that's going down in the helicopter that's crashed on the back and you got 15, 16 people in the water. Like that's, you know, they haven't experienced that yet. And that's, yeah. Yeah. Ooh. My, my daughter, um, or my granddaughter, eh, I'm dating myself again. My granddaughter asked me, <laughs> she watched, she watched that uh, movie about the Coast Guard rescue swimmers. The Guardian. And, uh, whoop, whoop. Yeah. My, <laughs> she asked me, she said, uh, she said, uh, Papa, is that what you did? I said, yes and no. Uh, there's some things in there that are true. And there's some things in there that aren't true. I mean, it's, 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 uh, yeah. a movie that's made for to sell tickets to, to make money yeah. it's it's got some truths to it but a lot of the truths a lot of things in there that are not true but uh uh that type of training that uh that you go through uh everybody that's ever been through it, any any rescue swimmer it doesn't matter today or 40 years ago uh it's it's some of the most intense training and one of the most prideful things i think any rescue swimmer that's ever been a rescue swimmer can look back at that time in their life and say that was some of the most intense training and the most prideful i've ever been about completing any type of training was the day that they graduate rescue swimmer school absolutely i yeah totally i i remember the day vividly when you pass your last multi and you know you've, you've made oh, it yeah. and you're like, oh, yeah, like you, you're, you know what? When you get to that point, you are allowed to walk around with a little chip on your shoulder, even though it's only for like a little while because you get put in check pretty quick when you get to your unit. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? I earned yeah, that you, chip you. and I'm going to wear it for just a little while. <laughs> As soon as you get to your first command, they knock it off pretty quick. That's right. You'll be like, all right, congratulations. Now knock that shit off. <laughs> <laughs> Time to learn what you're really going to get to do. <laughs> Man. Oh, Eric, I, I appreciate everything. I, I'm going to give the opportunity to you advice that you would pass on to all the younger guys that are, are about to come up and that are doing it now. I know I keep it vague in general, but the floor is yours, my friend. The only thing I really say is that, um, you know, the best command that you've ever, the best command there is, is always the one you're going to. And the worst command there is, is the one you just left. Uh, because you, as you go through rescue swimmer and you go through the community and you go through military life or anything in general, things always change. And, and there's always the next environment. You know, I did 30 years in the Navy. And I was always thought that I was going to do four years and ended up doing 30 because wow. every time, every time the opportunity or the next thing presented itself, I think when I went to rescue swimming school, it's, it put a sense of uh, accomplishment uh, in me that there was always the next challenge or the next thing that I wanted to accomplish. And I wanted to make E5 and I wanted to make E6, E7, you know, and by the time I got to E7, I was like, hey, this is pretty good. I think I'm going to stick around for a little while. And there was always the next challenge. There's always another challenge. If you're looking for that next challenge and you're improving yourself and you're taking chance of every opportunity that presents itself, getting your college classes. I, I, I left the Navy with a master's degree uh, and the Navy paid for every penny of it. Wow. I mean, they paid for the books. They paid for the cool schools. They paid for the classes. I did them while I was on the ship. I did them while I was on shore duty uh, and with tuition assistance, things like that. I, I left the Navy as a, as a command master chief with a master's degree, all from the Navy and the military. And they, they set me up for success. And uh, so a young guy coming up, don't focus so much on, 
that I'm going to get out. I'm going to do the short time. I'm only going to be here for a short period of time. And I'm going to go on and do something else. Because you look back at that and say, I never should have done that. I can't tell you how many people tell me. Oh, yeah. If I'd have stayed in, I'd have been retired by now. If I'd have stayed in, <laughs> if I'd have done this, I, I, I'd be living the easy life with a retirement check now. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's not necessarily that. It's, it's There are, are many challenges and many opportunities. You just have to to improve and keep doing better and, and, and keep going through the, through the process and, and you'll eventually make it. You'll be proud of what you did. I love it. I love it. I, I love the, where you're talking about the next challenge and always the next challenge it's and coming from the rescue swimmer mindset that we talk about it. it once you get through that, and you've had that accomplishment, that's what you drive for every single time. It's you. Now it's instilled. I am totally on board. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. Thanks. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, Eric, this has been a blast. A lot of these things I forgot about. <laughs> hey, I'm glad we could bring it all back up and reminisce. This was awesome. Yeah. So I appreciate yeah. you sharing, man. This is, this is great. And I'll tell you what, the next uh, – the rescue swimmer meeting that I can make it to the rescue swimmer reunion, man, I'll count me in. I'll, if I can get there, I'll be there. Okay. Just go to, you know, we kind of connected on Facebook cause you put that out there for uh, people that wanted to talk about, you know, their time in the Navy or the time of the rescue swimmer community. Uh, if they go to the U S Navy rescue swimmer uh, Facebook page, yep, they can look on there. They can look under the events section and it's listed under there. Um, and it's, it's hard to believe there's almost 4,000 members on that Rescue Swimmer page that are previous or current Rescue Swimmers. Nice. Uh, nice. Yeah, but if they go to that Facebook page, uh, they can look under the events section, and it'll talk about the Rescue Swimmer reunions. And like I said, they're every two years, except uh, last year was postponed. We had it in 15, 17, 19, and then in 21, but because of COVID, we had to – they had to they had to uh, postpone it until uh, this year, so it's this April. And so, if they go on there, they'll learn everything there is to know about it, and they can just keep an eye on it. And we'll they'll announce the next one two years from now. Okay, I love it. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm gonna start penciling on my calendar. I got to talk to my wife first, make sure she's cool with it. You know, got to talk to the boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, come Absolutely. on. So all of us know. We everybody listening right now is like, oh yeah, yeah. He knows what's up. <laughs> My yeah. wife is gonna hear this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, damn right. right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Eric. I tell you what, man. I, I won't take any more of your time. I appreciate everything. This has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation, and I I can't thank you enough. Really appreciate it. Glad to talk to you. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute to like, subscribe, and hit that share button. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you on as a guest. Or if you have any questions about rescue or anything else we talk about here, send an email to jason at therealrescue.com. That's jason at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q.com. You can also check us out on our web pages, therealrescue.com, our Facebook page, and our Instagram page at The Real Rescue. Again, a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember, when that star alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard.